So we have this wonderful opportunity to talk with you about conversion and prayer. So Father and I are going to go back and forth and we're actually going to be able to give you an experience of prayer before we leave. Because how can you talk about prayer and conversion without praying? So first of all, when Todd called and said that this was a, the focus would be on conversion, I thought, well, let me go to the catechism and let me look up what the catechism is really going to say conversion is. So in the glossary it says, conversion is a radical reorientation of the whole life, our whole life, away from sin and evil and towards God. A major shift. This change of heart or conversion is a central element of Christ's preaching of the church's ministry of evangelization. So who is it that calls us to conversion? Well, I looked this up. And the Catechism says in section 1427, <coughs> Jesus calls us to conversion. The Catechism goes on to say, this call is an essential part of the proclamation of the kingdom. Mark's Gospel says the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the Gospel. Makes me think of John the Baptist. Repent and return to God. Now, in the church's preaching, this call is addressed first to those who do, do not yet know Christ and his gospel. So baptism is the principal place for this first and fundamental conversion. It is by faith in the gospel and by baptism that one renounces evil and gains salvation. That is the forgiveness of all sins and the gift of new life. Most of us here today had this first and fundamental conversion as infants in our sacrament of baptism. But reading on further in the Catechism, it says in section 1428, Christ's call to conversion continues to resound in the lives of the Christians. This second conversion, a second conversion, is an uninterrupted task for the whole church. It is the movement of a contrite heart, drawn and moved by grace to respond to the merciful love of God who first loved us. So there is a second conversion, and it's ongoing throughout our lifetime. It is a movement, it says, of a contrite heart, what is a contrite heart? Well, Webster says that is a heart humbled by, guilt, humbled by guilt and repentance for one's sin. sins. We're afraid today of the word guilt or repentance, but it's needed <clears throat> because we are called to this by Christ. What does Christ call, why, or what does Christ call to second conversion actually mean for us? Well, in section 1430 of the Catechism, it tells us, Jesus is called to conversion and penance like that of the prophets before him, does not aim first at an outward, at outward works. Immediately we think, well, I'll get my life in order. I'll put on sackcloth and ashes. I'll go around with a long face and I'll make a lot of sacrifices. But fasting, but these sackcloth, ashes, fasting, and mortifications in the, in the beginning are not what the Catechism is talking about, but the conversion of the heart, the interior conversion. Without this, these penances mean really very little. Interior repentance is a radical reorientation of our whole life a radical reorientation, a return, a conversion to God with all our heart and the end of sin in our lives, a turning away from evil with a repugnance towards the evil actions that we have committed. Now without this radical reorientation and this experience of a second conversion, we can find ourselves sometimes feeling 
a repugnance almost towards the things of God, towards holiness. So why is it that the human heart needs conversion? What's wrong with my heart? Well, again, the Catechism tells us the human heart is heavy and hardened, section 1432. That's pretty hard to hear. God must give man a new heart, it says. I need a new heart. Conversion is, first of all, a work of the grace of God who makes our hearts return to him. So we can't do this on our own. It's God's grace working in our hearts. But I first have to recognize I really have a hard heart. It is in the discovering the greatness of God's love that our heart is shaken literally by the horror and the weight of sin. And it begins to fear offending God, but it begins to fear anything that would take us and separate us from God. How is the human heart converted? The Catechism tells us the human heart is converted by looking upon him whom our sins have pierced, upon Jesus Christ. And now in section 2566, it says, In the act of creation, God calls every being from nothingness into existence. Even after losing through our sin, our likeness to God, we still remain an image of God, of our Creator. We, and we retain this image and the desire for the one who calls us into existence. We still carry that. We have the image of God, we've lost the likeness of God, but we have the desire for God, for intimacy with God still within us. Further, the Catholic Catechism says the desire for God is written into the human heart. Isn't that beautiful? It's written on every human heart because man is created by God and for God. God himself wrote that desire in the heart. This desire for God is our driving motive behind our unceasing questioning of the purpose of our life. When I met my husband, John, in law school, they would hang out in a bar called the Buddha. And after a few beers, this was the question, what is life all about? Remember those years? So this desire for God is our driving motive behind this very question. Today, we could almost say that there is a feeling of emptiness, uselessness, a terrible feeling of darkness over the whole earth. Now we ask, how are we to undergo this second conversion? How will it happen? Well, I've been reading Pope Benedict's book on prayer. He answers this. He says the primary aim of prayer is conversion. We have a way. And he says the flame of God that transforms our heart and enables us to see God and so to live in accordance with God and live for others. So we must come very close to this flame, which is God himself, this burning, raging, passionate love for us. And then we will be able to see God as God is, and we will be filled with his love, and out of that, to love others. In finding our way now through prayer, we discover our eternal destiny. Exciting. And reconciliation with God that is offered to us through Christ's death and resurrection for true lasting happiness here and forever. This will come about if we are willing to open ourselves to the one who is able, as Benedict says, to fill the depth and breadth of our desires for purpose, God alone. 
instinctively all of us know we can turn to God, that we can pray. There was a survey done, and I believe the results were that all, over 90% of people say they've had an experience of God in their life. So just instinctively, we know, all people, that we can turn to God and pray. Now, Benedict tells us that prayer is an inner attitude. Ooh, attitudes, when you talk about attitudes, you're really getting deep into me. Before being a series of practices, formulas, it's a manner of being in God's presence before any acts of worship or spoken words. Isn't that beautiful? Well, it sounds easy. Yet, most of us find prayer to be difficult and mysterious. And we need to understand that we, when we encounter this feeling of, well, it's difficult, it's mysterious, we are encountering, a, a, in, we are encountering an important truth that we are unable to pray on our own. We must realize that prayer comes to us, to each of us, as a gift from God. And many of you are well-educated, successful people in your field. But when it comes to prayer, we are unable to pray on our own. This is where we find the difficulty. <coughs> What is required of us? This requires uh, of us humility in order to understand that we are a creature of the absolute God, his creature, that I am weak, poor, pitiable, ne pitiable needy, sinful, and unable for myself to find happiness and fulfillment apart from God. It cannot be found. When we come to know our creaturely status before God, then we are able to open our whole being to the mystery of God. This is very exciting. For fulfillment and happiness, beginning a most intimate, personal relationship with the Trinity God here, now, and for all eternity. But there is something that we must always remember. We must never forget that it is God who calls first to us. Section <coughs> 2567 in the Catechism says, In prayer, the faithful God's initiative of love always comes, our own, always comes first. Our own first step towards God is always a response. So we can feel like, I am searching for you, O oh God. But we must realize he is the one searching for his beloved. So what, so what would this conversion look like in a human life? And I'd like to share with you the conversion story of a saint, St. Ignatius of Loyola. Let me tell you about him. He was born in Spain, the year 1491, the Basque province of Spain. He was born into provincial nobility. His name would be Inigo de Lopez. He was born at the Castle Loyola, the last of 13 children. He, his mother would die shortly after his birth. And as he grew older, he wanted to leave the countryside for the royal household. His mother had connections to the royal treasurer's family. And he dreamed of becoming a royal courtier, a royal knight. So, growing up at 14, he convinced his father, he convinced <coughs> his family, and he finagled an invitation from the royal treasurer to go to live at the court, to live with the royal treasurer's family. He took to it like a duck to water. He loved it. He loved the beautiful clothes. He loved the uh, gambling, the dueling. He loved the um, womanizing. 
He loved everything about this life. And when he had a free time, he loved the racy novels. I call him the man of the millennium. He kind of would fit in today. He loved the beautiful clothes. He loved everything about his courtly life. And he dreamed I, of becoming a royal knight. Yes, he would become a royal knight and swear allegiance to his lord, the king of Spain. So he was there. He started his journey in the court at 14. About the age of 30, he was very, very convinced of his own success and that he could do anything for Spain and defend Spain at any moment. And there was a little city, a little fort called Pamploma that was going to be under siege, was on the way to becoming a, a forgotten city or fort because the French wanted it. They were approaching. He said, no, I'm going. I can save this fort. So he convinced the Navarre that he was the one. He was the knight to go. He took 2,000 men. Some 10,000 soldiers were approaching. Well, he convinced his men, no, don't worry, we may be outnumbered, but we will win this battle. No, he was wrong. The battle, they say, really lasted 10 minutes. He was gravely injured. A cannonball went right through both legs. And it was a different era. It was a different way of battling, of warring. The French picked him up, stuck him back together, carried him on a litter back home. He goes back home to daddy, back to the castle Loyola, and he's 30 years old. His dreams are broken. He's a broken man. He's broken hearted. But this is a tenacious individual. He gets home and he realizes, you know, I'm going to have a limp and I will not. He was a very vain man. They talked about his flowing blonde hair and the only picture I've ever seen of him is he's bald. <laughs> but he convinced his doctors to do a surgery. So they rebroke that leg, put him in a stretching device. Then he noticed the other leg was growing a protrusion of bone. So he couldn't wear those tall skinny boots. Saw it off, he said. They sought it off, no anesthesia at that time. So here he is, Inigo de Lopez, the royal courtier, back home in daddy's castle, a broken man. What would happen would change him forever and would change my life. So he needed something to do. What would occupy his time? He asked his brother, now who was master of the castle, his father had died. I need something to occupy my time. His brother's wife was a holy woman. She had trashed those racy novels, and all she had to offer him was the life of Jesus Christ, the life of St. Francis, and the life of St. Dominic. And Inigo de Lopez was a daydreamer. As he began to read, he thought, I will do more than Francis. I will do more than Dominic. But something was happening as he began to read the life of Jesus. He was captive audience for God. God had pursued him. God had gotten him. And now he was going to be converted. His conversion was complete and profound within 11 months at the age of 30. I told you he was a womanizer, and it would be there during his recovery at the Castle Loyola that the mother of God herself, Mary, appeared to him holding the infant Jesus and gave to him the infused grace of chastity. Never again would he struggle with this. So what would happen? He made the decision to abandon the service of the king of Spain, the superpower, for the service of the true king, King Jesus. And there would be one place he would live out his life, and that would be the city of his king, the holy city, Jerusalem. So when he was well enough to leave the castle, he had to kind of sneak out because his uh, relatives didn't want him to abandon his royal life. He put on the fine clothes, got on his donkey, and took off, headed for the holy city. 
but he made one stop down the road first, and this would be at a Benedictine monastery called Montserrat. And it would be there that he would spend three days writing out his confession. And then he would spend an all-night vigil before the Black Madonna, which is a custom of chivalry before you go to war. He would spend an all-night vigil, and he would take off that long sword and that dagger that he'd used and lay it right there on her altar. It's there today. You can see it. Then in the morning, he took off the beautiful clothes, gave them to the local beggar, got, gave him the donkey, and he put on sackcloth, and he was barefooted. He was now going to live his life as Inigo de Lopez, the penitent pilgrim. And he would walk barefoot to Jerusalem. But he couldn't get there yet because, you see, there was a plague in Barcelona where he was headed to get a ship. So he got a little further outside of uh, Montserrat to a place that we know the name today, Manresa. And it would be there at Manresa he would spend another 11 months praying some 15 to 17 hours a day. And he would record in a little black book the different experiences of graces that God used to convert him. And that's what we have today and what we call the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola. He's truly a mystic. He would pray for hours at the river Cardinier that ran through Manresa. And he would have great mystical experiences of the creation of the world, the presence of Jesus in the Eucharist, the incarnation and of the Holy Trinity. But he would never write about any of this. So what would happen? As God transformed him, as the conversion took, he left Manresa about, uh, after 11 months. He got to Jerusalem on fire now with his king, King Jesus, with love for God. He'd abandoned his sinful life, his life of service to the world, to the king, for the service of the king of kings. And he was on fire, so on fire that he caused a big stir in Jerusalem, and he was going to convert all the Moors. Well, eventually the provincial of the Franciscans had to threaten him with excommunication if he didn't leave. You've got to go. You're a lay person. You can't do this. This is reserved. You don't know anything. You're just a lay person. How can this be? This is reserved. You know, uh, you can't speak about sin or you don't know theology. It's not possible. So he would be obedient to this provincial. Remember this. He was always obedient to Holy Mother the Church. He returned to Spain immediately, and it would be there the Inquisitors, the Dominicans, got hold of him. <laughs> he was so on fire, I think he probably went back to the local pubs and shared with the Royal Knights the spiritual exercises. They think that perhaps he took the exercises and gave them to the King and Queen of Spain. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be terribly, it would be very unusual, I would say, in that era for a man to be giving spiritual exercises to a woman. But he was that uh, ahead of, in his thinking. So what did the inquisitors do? Well, they did put him in prison three times for his exercises. And what happened was they started to read them and pray them. And they said, well, we don't find anything wrong here, but we want you to do something. So he said, well, they said you could leave. He said, I'm not leaving until you give a stamp of approval on the exercises. Smart man, huh? So th he, they did, and he left. What did they ask? They asked that he stop dressing like a penitent pilgrim, that he dress like a student, that he go back to school, that he learn Latin, that he go and get a degree in theology, and he would be obedient. This would all eventually happen. He would study in France. He would get his degree. Some Jesuits say they can't find a record that he ever attended school. Some say they do. So, but he would go there. And wherever he went, his love for God was contagious. He would share this. And he drew, well, many men. So his conversion started at 30. And around the age of 45, he would become an ordained priest. He didn't know what God had planned for him. But by the time he was 65 years old and dying, as the founder of the Society of Jesus that we call the Jesuits today, he left 
1,000 Jesuits around the world on fire with the love of the King of Kings. Now this is what one life, one human life can do for God. If you're willing, if we're willing to be converted. This is what it looks like. And you're on the way to becoming a saint. Now let's talk a little bit about this Ignatian prayer. St. Ignatius tells us that the spiritual journey consists of a spiritual battle and that the starting point of the spiritual journey is actually the end. We start by asking, okay, why did God create me? And every step along this journey, everything in our life, is to be ordered to the answer to that question. I was created, Ignatius tells us this, I was created to praise, reverence, and serve God our Lord. We hear this from the Baltimore Catechism a little differently. Why did God make me? To know, love, and serve God. To be happy with God forever in heaven. But every thought, every word, every intention, every action, everything in my life is to be ordered to this purpose. Or as Ignatius called, puts it, ordered to the end for which I was created. Now we know Jesus Christ came in the flesh in order to reconcile us with the Father and to restore what was lost through the actions of our first parents. Now at the risk of oversimplification, I'll say this, prior to the fall, the relationship between the human beings and God their creator was unencumbered by obstacles. Just hold that in your mind. But then came original sin. You know, original sin entered our history and our life through the gift of the free will enticed by the lie of Satan. And we would say that at the root of that first sin was a free will decision to not believe what God had told them, but rather to believe the enemy, the serpent, Satan. And we all know the story. But the fact of the matter is, is that this first sin caused a catastrophic rupture in the relationship with the Creator. Their intellect became distorted. And what was good for them became less desirable, and what wasn't good for them became more desirable. Their, this fallen desire began pulling them further and further away from God. They began to, you might say, detach from God their creator, and to attach instead to what wasn't good for them. The human being lost sight of their purpose to know, love, serve God, to live with happiness with God forever. Their lives were no longer ordered to this very end for which they were created, but rather to themselves and their own selfish desires. So they continued to listen to the wrong voice, to believe the wrong voice, to follow the wrong promptings. Kind of sounds familiar, right? <laughs> Now, whereas before the fall, the relationship between the human beings and God, their creator, in whose image and likeness they were made, was intimate, unencumbered by obstacles, after the fall, as Carol's already mentioned, they lost this likeness to God, they became enslaved to sin, and that abundant life that they had, that God had given them, was gone. And that intimate relationship that we can pick up glimpses of in Genesis became distant and replete with obstacles. Okay, So you might say, well, that was then, this is now. Jesus' death and resurrection brought victory over Satan, sin, and death. We know this, right? Uh, moreover, Jesus died, we can say, for my sins, and I'm baptized into his death and resurrection. So why then is the spiritual journey such a battle, as St. Ignatius tells us? We know this, it resonates. Why the obstacles? Why am I so weak? Well, while it's true that original sin has been removed, that original sin, uh, there remains within us a remnant, and, and you probably know this word, we call it concupiscence, a sort of an inclination to sin. Yes, we're created good, but we are inclined to sin. We're pulled towards those things which are spiritually not good for us. 
This is manifested most clearly in what we call, refer to really as the selfish self, the brat within <laughs> that wants to take control of my free life, my free will, and satisfy me and my desires, my own sinful desires. It drives me to become attached to the wrong thoughts, to the wrong actions, the wrong things, the wrong people. So even though the victory has been won, each one of us must choose either life in Christ or life for the self, which in reality is life against Christ and for Satan. And so herein, as we're talking, lies this spiritual battle which Ignatius speaks about. The world and all it offers can be very enticing to our concupiscent, selfish self. And of course, Satan knows our weaknesses and tempts us in that direction. In addition, because of this reality of the human condition, this fallen reality, we know that human beings hurt each other, right? And most of us, probably everyone, has been wounded by others in some way or other that actually compromises our desire to live in Christ and may even, in the most serious cases, inhibit our free will to do what we feel we should be doing in terms of our desire to live in Christ. So much could be said about this, but suffice it to say for us today that every human being has these obstacles, okay, layers really, of obstacles in our relationship with God. In fact, it may sound a little bit uh, counterintuitive, but the further we go on the spiritual journey, <clears throat> the more the Lord begins to actually show us about ourselves and the sinful mess we really are without Christ. This reality of the human condition is the reason <clears throat> why some of the great saints who were considered living saints while they were alive, uh, St. Catherine of Siena, Padre Pio, they would rightly refer to themselves as sinners. The Pope, they said, describe yourself. He says, I'm a sinner. And they kind of like chuckle, chuckle. No, no, this is real. This is not uh, false humility. It's not just some uh, pious talk. It's the truth. The closer we get to God, the more God will allow us to see the gap I guess you would say, between us and God. St. Catherine in her book, The Dialogue, she referred to it as the book, her book, God told her, she wrote this down, remember Catherine, I am the one who is and you are the one who is not. Whew. That's pretty, pretty harsh. But this is true. St. Ignatius himself would say that he was his own biggest obstacle to his own relationship with God. This is the same. You know, the Lord, during this journey that they're on, that Ignatius was on, would peel off many layers of obstacles in the lives of him and these other saints. And with each layer, their selfish self would diminish, and they were more and more conformed to Christ. This is the journey, just being conformed to Christ. When you peel an onion a layer at a time, what's left when you're finished? Nothing, right? Nothing, okay? God keeps peeling, if we allow him with our free will to do so, until nothing of us and our selfish self remains. Only Christ remains. This is the process of sanctification. It's like a purification to sanctification. Our Catholic theology tells us that this journey of sanctification is the Holy Spirit's job so to speak. We cannot, as Carol said, we cannot do this on our own. And this is why every Jesuit will tell you that in Ignatian prayer, the director is the Holy Spirit. And moreover, they will tell you that their main job, when they're giving, the, this is how they say it, they don't say I'm directing the exercise, I'm giving the exercises. You heard Carol say that, you know, that Ignatius maybe gave the exercises. She doesn't mean he gave them a book of exercises, no, but what we would call directing the exercises. But the one who gives the exercises, their main job is to stay out of the way of the Holy Spirit. Say very little and watch the Holy Spirit work. As we, and we're going to get into this, Ignatian prayer is one way of this contemplative, deep prayer that Carol uh, introduced. 
as we pray Ignatian prayer, the Holy Spirit brings these obstacles we're talking about, sinfulness, woundedness, all that stuff, to the surface, a layer at a time, or however God wants to do this, because God wants to remove all these obstacles. God wants to heal them. God wants to forgive them. He, God wants a close, intimate, deep relationship with us, and he wants us to come to truly know and love him. Remember, the end for which we're created, to know, love, serve God. He wants us to truly know him, not just to know about him. Catechesis is important. We've got to learn about God, about our faith. But this prayer thing is a learning, a learning, not learning, but coming to actually know God. It sounds very inviting, doesn't it? But the peeling process that Ignatian prayer invites us into is not necessarily a pleasant experience. We have many disordered attachments to many things that are not conducive to this relationship with God, not conducive to this end for which we've been created. Our selfish self likes these attachments. We all have them, and we resist letting go. Okay. Now, paragraph 21 of his spiritual exercises, Ignatius writes that this journey of Ignatian prayer, this deep, contemplative Ignatian prayer, will help us, he says this, will help us overcome or conquer ourselves, this selfish self, and help us to order our lives in such a way that we make decisions, move through life, free of these disordered attachments. And so what this prayer does in a nutshell is it brings us a freedom in Christ. You know, Jesus said, if the Son makes you free, what? You'll be free indeed, right? Okay, so that's the first step. It starts bringing us in as we get rid of these obstacles, bringing us into this freedom. And as we pray, the freer we become in Christ, the more we're able to receive, enjoy, embrace this fullness of life that he promises us right here on this earth. And finally, the more of this abundant life that we enjoy, the more of it that we have within us, the more we become one with Christ and ultimately with the Trinity God. This is that relationship ruptured in the Garden of Eden, restored by Christ, as we enter into this invitation, this relationship, he wants this with us. This relationship with God, God created us for this, and this is the intimacy that in the depths of our being we long for. And this is what Ignatian prayer, the Ignatian journey, really is all about. Sure. Now in my reading of this book on prayer by our emeritus Pope Benedict, he says something that's very important. Prayer should not be taken for granted. He says, it is necessary to learn how to pray. It makes sense, doesn't it? And he says, it's as if we're this, in acquiring this art, ever knew even those who are very, very advanced in the spiritual life, he says they always feel the need to learn from Jesus to learn how to pray authentically. So the journey of prayer that was given to St. Ignatius almost it's over 450 years ago is a journey where the Lord Jesus himself teaches us to pray. And it's called the Spiritual Exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola. Some of you may have experienced these. No one ever teaches the spiritual exercises, but rather experiences them. You could go buy books on the spiritual exercises, buy the spiritual exercises, start reading them, you'll think you're reading Greek. You'll put them down. Because we are used to approaching everything with our intellect and understanding. And it won't work with prayer. We approach it only with our heart. So today now I want to give you a brief overview of exactly what are the spiritual exercises. 
and then we're going to give you an experience of prayer. So why is it called spiritual exercise? Okay, some of you are into exercise. You know that you don't just run into the gym and pick up a 500 pound weight. You have to work up. You have to begin. You have to stretch. You have to uh, work up from lighter weights to the heavier weights. So prayer is spiritual exercise. And we really need to exercise our spirit in prayer. You know why? Because we want to join our spirit with the Holy Spirit. That's our guest that lives within us. Creating this great, big, fat, juicy, not muscle, but a heart dripping with the love of Jesus Christ. How's that sound? So it takes perseverance. And I'm going to let you in on a secret. No one ever arrives at prayer. Everyone just prays. I find that freedom. Now, St. Ignatius, when he was at Man, when he was recovering at um, the Castle Loyola, began his journey of prayer with the scriptures. They say he prayed some 15 to 17 hours a day when he was at Manresa, living in the caves. The Dominicans fed him. They, they taught him. They did, helped him with some spiritual direction. But he would pray 15 to 17 hours a day. And that even when he was in Rome as the master general, I, with all of these men that he was forming as Jesuits, he prayed five to seven hours a day. So we always want to take time to get on the journey and to prepare for this journey. We can't become a marathon runner overnight. I had a daughter that did that. To this day, she has terrible hips. <laughs> it's a mess. So St. Ignatius gives us warms, warm ups. He starts us out. And he starts with what he calls the principle and foundation. And it's a short little writing, very succinct, very s simple, but it really it entails the entire spiritual exercises. But there's a really important line in there where he says, that he gives us the purpose for our existence. I'm sure all of you have wondered. And he answers it this way. He says, we were created to praise, reverence, and serve God, our Lord, and by means of this, to save our soul. So we have a responsibility. We have to accept. We have to respond to God's offer. By how? By doing what? By praising, reverencing, and serving God as our Lord. Now the exercises he breaks down into four sections or four weeks. They're often referred to as four weeks. And the first week is always called sin purification. It starts out with the history of sin, the fall of the angels, man's rebellion, the truthfulness of our sinfulness and need for redemption. Now, a lot of thinking today wants to bypass purification. I don't want to look at my sins. I don't want to hear I'm guilty. Please don't bypass it. It's it's more important than any of the, it's very, very important because as we progress on this road of prayer, journey to Jesus, we can really be turned, we can be ground meat for the enemy, destroyed, ministries destroyed, churches destroyed, because we bypass our purification. And we claim these graces, these wonderful gifts of God as our own. So we're just kind of like bowling pins in an alley. Boom, we're just knocked out. And how many have never returned to the church? Because this step was left out. I love it. My, it's changed my marriage. My husband loves it. It's let me, it's, I'm able to see my sinfulness, my selfishness, my greed, my ingratitude, 
It's beautiful. It's wonderful. It's exciting. I don't have to, ha I don't have to be that person all the time, forever. So that's the first week. And then he takes us to uh, after our experience of purification. And the truth of who I am, I am a sinner in need of redemption, forgiveness. And the Redeemer is Jesus Christ, my Savior. After that, guess what happens? My Savior, the King of Kings, calls me into mission with him. Wow, that's the mission of an evangelist. I'm called to serve with him in his mission of redeeming the whole world for his Father in heaven. Isn't that exciting? That's the work of an evangelist. So there's the bridge, Jesus. And we go now into the second week. Now the second week is we are invited to come to know and love Jesus intimately because we will journey with him in prayer using the scriptures from the incarnation, his birth, all the way to Palm Sunday. In my life, often I've said, oh God, help me, be with me, help me in my life. This is an invitation from the King of Kings to be with him, to journey with him, to sit and listen to him. Isn't that beautiful? To sit at the feet of the Master and to, to observe his life, to share in his life, just like the apostles and the disciples. So then we're invited into the third week. St. Ignatius calls it the third week. We are invited to go with Jesus to his passion and his death. It's very difficult to journey with a loved one through their suffering and death. And we always call for Jesus in our suffering. But do you know he calls for us? Come and be at my side in my passion and suffering and death. And then the fourth week, St. Ignatius takes us into the joy of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. To be there at the moment when he is raised from the dead and he goes to visit his mother first. That's exciting. This is a tradition in the church. I don't know if it started with St. Ignatius, I think it started earlier. But this is one of his beautiful meditations, that he went first to Mary. But to share in the joy, the joy that Jesus experienced at his resurrection. And then, to conclude the exercises, he ends with what he calls the contemplatio, the learning to love like God. So, what is that? Well, we look at all of our life and everything that God's given us, everything, the creation of the universe, the earth, our life, everything, with deep, deep gratitude. And then we want to return with great love and gratitude. Everything is given to him. Everything is given to me. I give to you, O oh God, for your glory. It's a most exciting, awesome journey. It's a journey that will convert a hard heart like mine and yours. The Catechism says our hearts are hardened. Well, the starting point for Ignatian prayer is what we call the memory imagination. The memory imagination is one of three faculties of the mind, or as St. Thomas Aquinas would say, powers of the soul. The other two are the intellect, the understanding, the place where we reason, and the will. Okay. Now, in Ignatian meditation and contemplation, all three faculties are at play. But, as I already said, we always enter the prayer through the memory imagination. Now, uh, there's all kinds of, there's differences even in traditions about how the different traditions define things like meditation and contemplation. That's a whole separate thing. But let's just say for purposes here, 
I want to uh, uh, explain that Ignatius uses the term contemplation, which is what we're going to do today a little bit, contemplation very specifically, and it's just by definition, okay? And that is, is it's a prayer experience that's rooted in a gospel scene. It has to be a gospel scene with Jesus present, okay? Just by definition, okay? And other things, you'll, you'll be, he'll be referring to it as meditation. But let's just move into this. To enter into contemplation, St. Ignatius instructs us, okay, to, first of all, read a particular passage of the scripture, and let's say he asks us to do it twice. We're going to do that today. Then he tells us we beg for an Ignatian grace, okay, and that's something that's given to us. Then we close our eyes, and here's where we get into these powers of the soul or these faculties of the mind. We begin by imagining the scene. What does it look like? Who's present? Are there houses? What does it smell like? And this may sound strange, but the human person really does have what's referred to our spiritual senses that are analogous to the physical senses. So that when you go into prayer, by the grace of God, it's all grace, as Carol said, all of it is, that it's very possible to have these spiritual senses uh, uh, initiate and the scene can literally come alive. St. Ignatius refers to this then as, as we become a part of it, that we enter the scene. You've probably heard this terminology. And if this happens, we could find ourselves in that scene, maybe just way in the back observing, maybe uh, right there in the middle of everything. Maybe we're ourselves in there. I, sometimes I'm in my habit in this scene. Or you could be an animal. You could be you could be standing there at the foot of the cross and Jesus died. Whatever it is that the grace of God allows. So when Carol talks about this with this excitement of actually being there on the journey with Jesus, this grace, it doesn't necessarily happen to everybody or all the time, but it can happen where we actually enter, the scene comes alive, we enter and we're with Jesus. Now what happens in this kind of a prayer will often reveal something about our relationship with Jesus. So let's say we enter a scene, and we say, why am I afraid to go over and sit down? Jesus is kind of motioning for me to sit down. Why can't I do that? Why don't I want to look at him in the face? Mary's holding out the baby Jesus for me to hand. To, why can't I go there? I know this might sound a little strange to you, right? But Jesus is wanting to know us. Now, in a nation contemplation, when I begin to feel this kind of resistance, then the other faculties of the mind or powers of the soul kick in. So I'm, I enter this scene, this starts to go on, but then I don't want to look at Jesus and I'll start to say, moving into my brain, my intellect, like, why don't I want to do that? Or what's going on here, Lord? And then what we do in Ignatian prayer, we simply turn it over to the Lord with our will, the third faculty of the, of the mind, and just say, Lord, whatever this is, why I can't look at Jesus or why I can't do this. Whatever's going on here, whatever obstacle there is here between me and the Lord, heal it, please. Get rid of it. Because it's showing us something in this scene, but it's reflecting something deep within us that really is an obstacle in our relationship with God, that God really wants to move out of the way so that he can get closer to us and we can get closer to him. You know, you might be wondering at this point why St. Ignatius would actually claim in this contemplative prayer that you can actually encounter the Lord when in fact we're talking about going into the imagination, right? You hear it said, it's only in the imagination, right? It's like fantasy. It's like make-believe. If I were to ask most people, and probably in here too, and, and, and ask you and say, what faculty of the mind is higher, more valuable, greater, the understanding, the reasoning, or the imagination. Most people say, well, obviously, the intellect. I mean, this is where we have, I mean, science, logic, uh, medicine, philosophy, and yes, even our own ability to learn about our faith. This all comes out of this great gift of the intellect. But when it comes to opening ourselves up to know and be known by God, a kind of knowledge, not of the head, but a knowledge of the heart. Carol was talking about this, the heart. 
the knowledge of the heart. The intellect can't go there. The intellect has its limits. We operate by logic, by reason. But this faculty of the imagination, it opens. And, and that's the faculty that sort of goes there in this desire to come to really know. Not know about God, but to know God and let God in to us. One image we can put in our mind is it's sort of like a, an opening or a window to the soul, a window to the depths of us, the window to the heart where God can actually come in and not have to try to fight through the logic and the, it's like, well, that can't be happening. <laughs> no, we go in and just let him come in that way. And you'll find when this happens, yes, this is the same faculty where we daydream, where we fantasize, where we write stories and make things up. But when you're in it, and then all of a sudden, God's going to use that, and before you know it, bingo, you're going to say, oh my God, I think I just encountered the Lord himself. Now, it sounds strange, and it might sound impossible to you, and St. Ignatius himself would hesitate to try to even explain this like I'm trying to do, because, as Carol said, Ignatian prayer really has to be experienced. But we're trying to give you a little bit of a, a sense of this. And, and keep in mind, if this doesn't happen to somebody, it's not like it's a failure. Every time we pray, it's efficacious. Something wonderful happens. But sometimes this happens, okay? Um, and so if you do get into this kind of prayer and you do beg for this grace of contemplation and the Lord does this, you will know that it's real. You will know that it can happen, that it's possible. One last thought on this, and that is, I think some of you, chances are some of you in here are very much like me. When Carol first introduced me to Ignatian prayer in 2002, I told her that, well, I, first of all, I knew nothing about it, but once I got to know a little bit about it and I started pray, trying to pray it a little bit, I said, well, this really isn't for me, I don't think, because I, I'm more intuitive, not sensing, you know, those terms, okay? In other words, I tend to feel and intuit spiritual things rather than visualize or hear, okay? That's just the way I am. So I said this to Carol and she didn't respond. She just smiled. I thought, I could win this argument, <laughs> but she won't argue. <laughs> she just kind of smiled. And then a couple of days later, maybe it was a week later, just out of the blue, she just said to me, we were working on something, and I, she said, did you have a nativity set under your Christmas tree when you were a child? And I said, well, yeah. She said, what did it look like? Do you remember? And I said, oh, yeah, I sure do. And I began to describe the little chip and the one figure that and what the animals looked like, and on and on. And then she just looked at me and she said, you can see it, can't you? And I said, wow, I can. Not like a movie, but there in this memory imagination, God presented that to me <coughs> in a way that an intuitive person can actually see spiritually. And it's hard to explain, but it is real. 